all my eager readers. Um, we're getting closer. We're over halfway done with our book. So it's exciting. Um, let's see. So we heard from Jeremy. Um, oh, he keeps getting like, he got like a mysterious phone call recently. And um, this person won't tell him who they are. And he's leaving Joe's house. Remember, Joe's the girl in the wheelchair that, like, is also researching Bigfoots. Um, and he can't seem to... Sorry, there is an ambulance page. Anyways, um, he has no idea who this person is, but this person left, um... A voicemail and they're like don't worry about the girl she's just gonna slow you down keep looking for the Bigfoots because they're real and we're almost there um, and that's that's where I left off so we are going to be going back to Millie so we're gonna be hearing from Millie now Millie Septima stood in the doorway of Millie's bedroom her hands entwined fingers tugging at her wrist fur you barely had two bites at the feast. Well, I'm not hungry. Millie was lying on her bed, fully clothed, face toward the wall. It was Halloween. Halloween night. Except Halloweening had been canceled after old Aunt Yetta came across a new picture that had been posted on the line. A shot that proves conclusively once and for all that Bigfoots are real. Millie hadn't seen the picture. Hidden in the lookout tree, watching the others meeting, she was too far away to get a good look at what it showed. From what she could hear, though, it sounded like the year. Or at least the old Aunt Yetta didn't believe that it was real. <sighs> Not year. It's just the old picture of Cassandra. And then just an over a little you with some pine needles and some mud, old Aunt Yetta pronounced. Millie felt her fur prickle and bristle with alarm. Could that be the picture Alice had told her about? The flyers the mean girls had posted showing her alongside an assortment of monsters? Nugget, she thought. I should say something. Instead, she just listened. Ricardin glanced fiercely at old Aunt Yetta. Real or not, it doesn't matter. If the Nopers believe it, they'll come looking and it won't be long before they find us. We should go, whispered Alia, who'd been tugging so hard at the fur on her cheeks that she'd given herself a few bald patches. We should pack up the village. We should go somewhere far where there aren't any cities. Maybe up north where it's cold. We can't leave, said Junie, one of the younger female year. I just planted my perennials. And why would the Nofers look here? Old Aunt Yetta asked. None of them are knowing where the picture was taken. There's nothing that would draw them to our forest. Measures must be taken, Ricardin said as his wife nodded her enthusiastic agreement. Always safe. Never sorry. We must have new rules about noise. Perhaps guards at the perimeter, and we should cancel Halloweening. At this, a chorus of gasps came from some of the younger year. No Halloweening? whispered Frederick, whose fur seemed to droop. Silence! You do not have the speaking stick, Ricardin said. Lips curled disdainfully to show his large front teeth. Halloweening was always foolishness. Far too risky. We can be having our own feasting, and that will be that. Millie gave a soft growl, feeling like she'd cry. She knew what that a year, she knew what a year celebration would include: rabbit casserole and sweet stewed pumpkin, sweet and savory hand pies, baked apples, and poached pears and sugar roasted walnuts. Games of checkers and chess and Scrabble played quietly around the fire. No dashing down the strange streets right along the Nofer kids. No walking up to no fur doorsteps, bold as can be, ringing, ringing their doorbells, holding your bag open, waiting for them to drop delicious candy chocolate inside. No shouts and no laughter. No pretending, the way Millie always did, that she was a no fur girl in a Bigfoot costume, that at the end of the night she'd pull off fur-covered boots, unpeel her sleeves and cuffs and wig, and unzip her skin, stepping out of it and leaving it puddled on the floor. 
to emerge a smooth-skinned little girl, no different from the fairies and princesses and witches and superheroes with whom she'd spent the night. They don't know where to look, Old Aunt Yetta snapped. They'll find us. Alia's voice was almost a moan. They'll be coming with their helicopters and their bright lights and their littlies on the ATM machines. ATVs, whispered Millie and rolled her eyes. Silence, she heard her father rumble. Ricardin is right. Ricardin preened, his fur bristling, making him look bushier and bigger. It's too risky. There will be no Halloweening this year. Millie had almost jumped out of the tree in frustration and fury. Instead, she decided that minute that she would have her Halloweening that she'd go trick-or-treating no matter what her father decreed. By then, she'd crossed the lake three times already to visit with Alice. Each time, she'd borrowed Frederie's clothing, although she supposed it wasn't technically borrowing because she hadn't technically asked for permission to wear his clothes or take the tribe's single canoe. She had eaten brownies and cookies and granola and had listened as Alice had wept about how much being a, called a monster and a freak had hurt her and offered what comfort she could. Not that Millie had met an actual nofer, no fur, she could see that maybe no fur life wasn't as grand as she imagined, and that being year was maybe not so bad at all. Year mothers and fathers did not abandon their littlies, putting their lives in the hands of educational consultants, sending them away to sleepaway camps and boarding schools, seeing them only a handful of days every year. If Alice had been year, she would have been treasured. While the grown-up year were still chanting their final blessings, Millie had slipped out of the tree, raced to old Aunt Yetta's house, and pulled the top lap. Pulled the top lap out from old, from its box underneath old Aunt Yetta's bed. She logged on to the email account she created and sent a message to Alice that read, "Can I go trick or treating with you?" Then she sat fidgeting and looking over her shoulder until finally she had her answer. Yes. The night of Halloween, Millie, who'd been in what her mother called a mood, since the decision was made, had left the feasting early and spent the night in bed. At 7 o'clock, she announced that she was going for a walk. By herself? Septim asked. She kept her voice gentle, but her hands were working, plucking at her apron or the fur on her fingers. I want to be alone, said Millie taking care to sound extra pouty. But I would like a small snackle. Her mother filled her pack sack with treats from the feasting, and Millie walked down to the lake. Glad it was a cloudy night. The canoe was right where she'd left it the last time. It was the work of just a few minutes to slide the boat into the water and start paddling towards the opposite shore. Alice was waiting for her, dressed in a long coat with a belt, a banded hat, and a pair of dark sunglasses that were pushed up her forehead so she could see. Millie, you're here, she said, and smiled and gave Millie a hug before looking, up, looking her over. Seeing Millie as she really was, in all her furred glory for the first time. Wow. Millie had fashioned a kind of hood with a collar out of a piece of brown velvet from Septima's scrap bag. She wore Flory's work boots and carried one of Old Aunt Yetta's walking sticks. Are you an Ewok? Alice asked. An Ewok? Out, Millie confirmed. The Nofers usually guess Bigfoot when they saw the larger Little East trick-or-treating. When they saw Millie, they typically said Ewok, which Millie had learned on the line were small teddy bearish creatures that lived on made-up moon called Endor and whose presence had ruined a movie called Return of the Jedi. Millie smoothed her fur as Alice circled her. Wow, she said, this costume is awesome. The year are excellent seamstresses, Millie said. This was true, or at least according to the customers who'd posted reviews on Etsy. Come on, Alice said. We're going to trick-or-treat on campus first, and then they're taking us into town. Millie marched up the hill following her friend, who adjusted her pace so that Millie didn't have to struggle to keep up. The air was crisp and smelled like autumn, like fallen leaves and fireplaces, and Millie couldn't stop looking at the nofers in their costumes. Some were dressed as superheroes with boots and capes and paper mache shields. There was a boy whose hair looked like it had been electrified with his face painted white and his lips painted black. And a girl in an enormous white hoop skirted gown and matching white hat with a green satin brim. From the way Alice avoided her, Millie guessed that this was the infamous Jessica, who tricked Alice into thinny dipping and taking her picture. 
I should warn you, Alice said. The stuff the learning guides hand out is probably going to be like no bake kale cookies or something. Millie nodded. She didn't care about the candy and had her small snackle and thermos of tea in case she got hungry. He looked at her friend. What are you being? Alice sighed, pulling her hat down tightly over her forehead. I'm the Invisible Man. Millie assumed this was another reference to a book she hadn't read or a TV show that she'd never seen. Simply nodded. After hearing what had happened to Alice, she understood why her friend would want to be invisible. Hi, Alice, said a girl dressed in all white with a white helmet and, and a face mask who was carrying a slim silver sword. Who's your friend? snuffled the girl in the fancy flounced green dress with a green wig and green face paint. This is Millie. What are you dressed as? Alice asked. The green girl sniffled. I'm mucus she said, looking glum. She turned to Millie. Are you from Standish? Well, I'm camping with my friend on the other side of, with my family on the other side of the lake, Millie said. She couldn't believe that she was actually talking to not just one, but three no fur girls, and that so far they seem to be accepting her as one of their own, except the one all in white who is studying her curiously. Well, that's an amazing costume, she said, walking in a slow circle around Millie, who felt her fur begin to bristle. The girl reached out to stroke her, and Millie forced herself not to flinch or tell the other girl. Raya, she thought, how rude it was to touch someone's fur without permission. Where's the zipper? Raya asked. Sewn into the seam, Millie squeaked. She's an Ewok, Alex said curtly. Millie sensed something, some mixture of fear and sympathy in the other girl's attitude toward Alice. The way they seemed to choose their words carefully when they talked to her, the way they held their bodies. Alice isn't like them, Millie thought, and for some reason the idea gave her a thrill. She liked the idea that Alice didn't belong entirely to the Nofer world, that she belonged instead to Millie. The four girls approached the first of the learning guide's cottage. Trick or treat! called Taylee, knocking on the door. It was opened by a soft-voiced, mild-looking person named Clem, who praised their costumes and offered them carrot, carob coconut bars before frowning at Raya. I thought Phil and Lori said no weapons. Well, I have permission, Raya said crisply. And when he'd shut his door, she smiled and said, actually, I don't. Millie held her, open her sack, accepted her treat, and with Alice by her side, and with Rayleigh Raya and Taylee arguing aloud whether Raya's everyday fencing gear constituted a costume, trotting off in a swelling crowd of no fur kids dressed as clowns and peacocks and ballet dancers and mummies and things Millie couldn't begin to identify. <gasps> the boys were whooping as they ran from cabin to cabin. The girls were chattering, complimenting each other on their hair and their clothes. As a girl strutted by in high heels, followed by a pair of giggling bedsheet ghosts, Millie, feeling nervous, grabbed Alice's hand. Are you okay? asked Alice, who looked puzzled but friendly and nice. She won't hurt me, Millie told herself. She's not like they say. I am okay, Millie said, and made herself go and follow Alice up the three steps and onto a seat on the school bus, which roared to life and went lurching down the road. The boys were singing, 99 bottles of beer on the wall, and the girls were pulling mirrors out of their purses and pockets to inspect themselves. Millie shut her eyes and leaned her head back against the pebbled plastic of the bus seat, trying to make her knees stop quivering, thinking that working her way into the no-first society was the first necessary step toward her eventual stardom. I made it. I'm here, she thought. I'm really here. And we're going to stop right there and come back tomorrow and you'll hear from Alice.